morning, everyone. Welcome to what is the penultimate lecture in Professor Leon Chua's series of 12 lectures. I'd like to begin by reminding those of you who've had the misfortune of missing any of the first 10 that they're all available online. Just Google Chua, C-H-U-A, lectures, and it's the first thing that pops up. So it's easy to find on HPE's website. Now today, Professor Chua is going to teach us some more about some of the elegant methods that he's developed for uh, understanding and dealing with nonlinear dynamics and chaos. Although, frankly, I have to say that having in the past volunteered in some of my elementary uh, age uh, children uh, computer classrooms, that I feel qualified to teach today's lecture, teaching monkeys to compute. But I'm sure you'd prefer to uh, hear Professor Chua's version. So without further ado, Professor Chua. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just to, to remind you that my next lecture will be the last one. Uh, I will be handing out a souvenir, a one-page uh, poem that I, that I wrote that I thought would, would summarize the last lecture nicely. And I, uh, so I encourage you to be here. I'll hand it out personally to you as a token of this series of lectures. OK, uh, how many of you, by the way, have seen this book or know about this book? Can I just have a show? Not too many. Well, anyway, uh, the, the motivation for this talk is actually to provide a foundation for this, uh, what I call a very nice book, but uh, has a, a lot of uh, missing details. And um, most of this 1,200-page book I'll actually devote it to fascinating examples and pictures. They're, they're so fascinating that I actually spent six years trying to make it right, OK? Because almost all of these books are empirical. You know, I mean, it's empirical nature. But when it first came out, and in fact, for, remained for many months, it was showed up in the first uh, bestseller list, and which is very unusual for a technical book uh, on, a, uh, on, on you know, to be a number one for many, many weeks. Okay? And the, the part of the preface that Wolfram wrote is that I have discovered, I mean Wolfram talking, okay? I have discovered vastly more than I ever thought possible. And in fact, what I have now done touches almost every existing area of science and quite a bit besides. So it's, it's a very strong statement, of course. And just for those of you who didn't know who Wolfram was, he was born in London, 1959 published his first paper at age 15, so he's clearly a genius, OK? Earned his PhD in physics at Caltech at age 20. And, and I believe uh, um, one of Gelman actually uh, recruited him to Caltech. So, so it was really a hot shot. One of MacArthur's genius fellowship, at age 21, created a software mathematics at 29, age 29. And uh, it's a certain uh, multi-million. So, so he's somebody that, that uh, is uh, a very distinguished person. And uh, many reviews, favorable, and that uh, review had appeared. One of them I just quote uh, from John Casti, said that a new kind of science is a book that simply cannot be ignored. Such a book appears only once every few decades, and, and I completely agree with that review. And in fact, this uh, book, uh, when it first came, has created so much noise that, that uh, in fact, it was the only example I knew that he, some academic was invited to Washington, DC. You know, uh, uh, he. He, he, he was, in, in fact, to the Senate, Senate hearing. And the, the chairman of the, that hearing is Senator Brownback. Some of you may have remembered he was one of a Republican candidate for president in the 2008 election. He, 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 he didn't make it, but, but he was that person. So he, he was quite convinced. He said that uh, it seems like this work could have enormous potential. If it's right, then the government should be investing in it. OK, so, so this is something that, that uh, is, uh, attracted a great deal of attention when it first came out. And, uh, but there were uh, quickly uh, many praises with many criticisms. So I'll just quickly say, a lot of people say hell is a masterpiece. And I, I agree with it in some sense. But some say it's a brute force computer simulation cannot be a masterpiece. There are people who say it's a new scientific revolution. But there were people who said that there's nothing new in it that is really surprising. There were people who said this is comparable 
to impact the Newton's Principia. In fact, Wolfram himself hinted that, okay? And there were others who said that it's comparable to the team to much ado about nothing. And of course, a lot of people, and we all agree it's a work of genius, and others who would, would rather be more negative say it's work of egoist, and, and, and they're all true in some sense, okay? So what's all the fuss about? Uh, the, the fuss is that World from Brook is based on just brute force computer simulation. There's not a single theorem. In fact, there's only one, a really important one, and that was not proved by him, by somebody else that we'll talk about later. So um, all France book is full of exciting empirical examples and partial truths. I call it partial truths because partial truths are not truths, okay? And, uh, and, and there's no such thing as an almost theorem. So, so what I'm going, I've spent six years trying to, to, to provide the foundation to make it right and this is what my talk about. And I've written six books. In fact, it came, so, came out so interesting. Uh, this, is, this is just one of a six volume. And, and it, it, it is written at a very elementary level. That's why there are six volumes. But it provides a complete foundation for almost everything in this book. Okay. So the, the thing we're talking about in this book is very simple. It's just a, a CNN. We have seen CNN on, 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 on an array, two dimensional, or even three dimensional. Or you can have one dimension uh, on a ring so that uh, the boundary condition is, is uh, trivial, you know. And, and so we label this just for the, this today talk from cell zero, one, two, three, all around until the last one is capital I. So when you see the capital I symbol in my slide, that means that's the last one. So I plus one is the, the length. But I can be anything from, say, uh, 50 to a billion you know, or, and as large as you want. In fact, in today's talk, when we talk about Turing machine, I should be as large as, it, as you wish, okay? It, uh, okay, so the, and, and the, this, the subject is very simple. It, it's, it's a cellular automata, uh, or it's, it's a special case of CNN, where you have only one dimension. So you have immediate left neighbor and right neighbor. You are at cell I, okay? And, and so, so since there are only three cells that determines the rule, uh, you have only eight combinations, uh, and those are the eight patterns, you know, uh, that I color red and blue. And you can decide what the rule is by just filling out on the right the output. That's called a truth table. So any combination of red and blue, which is for zero and one, is, is, is one rule. And, and, and the whole game here is to see, given such a rule, and given any initial pattern, uh, you're going to keep iterating it and see what happened. Okay. And you see if a fantastic thing can happen. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, so, so, so now I fill in the, the, third, the, the fourth column, the output Y is the output column. And uh, rather than, rather than sort of remembering all these numbers, uh, all these colors, which is almost impossible, it's easier to think of that as a, a digital work. So uh, red is, is one, so from Top to down or right to left is, is one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. So, so you can think of this as, as a, it's a binary world and that's, the number is 137. So it's easier to, to just, just code, say, um, when I'm talking about this truth table, I say it's rule 137, okay? And uh, now, the, as I said, the, the, the goal here is to uh, start with the initial condition pattern and then you e iterate, every, every iteration there's a clock, okay? And, and, and uh, so, but, but for every, every cell, you, you only need to look at your left and your right. And based on the rule, you can see what output should be, should be red or blue. So, so this, this would be, for example, for 137, this would be a blue, as you see shortly. And uh, for, say, pick another cell. Uh, this would be another blue, uh, based on the, the code, things like that. So, so uh, but we have a ring, so uh, for now, I just show you a ring. So you start with, with the initial condition at time zero, and then you have a clock that uh, kicks in one, two, three. Every time you do that, uh, every time you, the clock clicks on, uh, every cell will look left and right and decide what is its next evolution. So that's what the game is. So like zero to one, uh, this for rule 30, I mean to 137. Okay, so, so, but of course it's inconvenient for drawing a cell in there, so we're gonna cut it. And just remember, the first and the last are going to be joined together, OK? So this is what's called a, <clears throat> a spatial pattern, space from left to right and time from top to down, OK? Now, so the, the time evolution of a ring of binary patterns in accordance with the truth tables 
uh, which is generally called the local rule, is called a cellular automata. Wolfram's book, in fact, is just about cellular automata, one dimension of CNN. In this lecture, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what I developed. It's called the analytical theory. Remember, Wolfram has no theory, OK? I have now a precise analytical theory. So when I say I have a theory, it's a theory. It's 100% true, not just 95%. It's not partial. It's, it's a theory. And it, it, of course, it's, you've seen already day one, this Toshiba chip. And this will be a trivia, trivia implementation. You just write a simple uh, code, uh, two lines. You know, just, and, and that will do it. In fact, uh, instead of uh, a three by three uh, template, you have zero on top in the bottom row, so it, because it's one dimensional. And, uh, and uh, these are just the details. The, the important thing today is that uh, 137, you see, is, is going to be very significant for us. So I, I keep using the same number. And it turned out that you can have two sets of templates, uh, like I indicated there. And these two sets, if you add them, so you just write a two statement sell uh, uh, to the Toshiba chip, and it will execute that uh, for, for you. So it's, it's, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a special case of CNN, OK? Now, uh, so you can think of this cell as a, as a neuron from now to, uh, for today's talk. So you have a neuron with only three synapses coming in and one output the action, OK? And so, so imagine now a brain made up, uh, since they, they are two to the two to the three, uh, or 256 distinct. Uh, uh, right column that you can pick. That, that's that how many uh, distinct local rules you have. And each one of them will now be coded by our digital, digital world from 0 to 255. Okay? And, and so, so we, are, we, we are going to be looking at all 255, 256 rule. And that's what Wolf, Wolfram did. And imagine now Wolfram sitting late at night in his computer and, and sort of just uh, going through every one of them. And, and, and they were sitting there sometimes forever because some of them never stops and just keep going. So it's, it's, it's sort of incredibly interesting thing, also incredibly boring thing. And the, the deal here is, uh, should you be turn red or bl uh, blue? So to file or not to file is my slogan here, OK? Uh, so to file means you can think of a neural or not to file. It's, it's, think about brain just like that. To file means that you have a pattern that it recognizes it files, uh, you know. So firing means plus, plus a red one, a firing pattern. So for uh, back to 137, again, you can see there are only three rows that, give, that would fire the red one. So I call those, the first one, all blue. The second one, two red on the right, and then the third one, all red. These are the three firing pattern for 137. And I keep using 137 as an example, but it will turn out that it is also the, the, the most exciting example. So I keep using the same, that, that thing. In fact, uh, 137, as you see later on, is uh, a universal Turing machine. That's, that's what, and that, that's what a monkey can emulate. OK, and uh, so, so, so the reason I use monkey here, by the way, this is my talk today is in, in some sense also a call to arms uh, for people to start teaching school-age children, and I really mean school-age children, uh, many concepts of phenomena, nonlinear phenomena, that you don't really need advanced mathematics at all. And, and that's why I, if I give, give a couple of lectures already to some kids and, and to motivate them, I use monkeys, OK? So that's why the monkey is here. And in fact, to make, make it fun for kids, we're talking about eight, nine-year-old kids, you know, I would go and bring these two flags, I'm the monkey. OK? And, and so they get the kids uh, excited. And this is how we could teach school age children. And, and, uh, and I'm going to show you how we can do it. So for 137, I, uh, that we teach a monkey just to learn this three pattern. And every time a monkey in the middle sees one of the three patterns, he will raise his red flag. That, that's what. So I think you, the kids all agree that the monkey can, can do that, can be taught to do that. OK? All right. And, uh, So at T0, the, the game is you uh, start with the initial pattern, such as that. And then the next, it, uh, the, it, the, the, the clock will ring. And then the, each monkey will look left and right. And if it's a firing pattern, he will raise the red flag. And that's one. And you keep going. Of course, because it's monkey, you, you need a clock. OK? So these are, uh, again, the, 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 you, you, you look left, and you, you look right, so the kids will understand that. And then you look at yourself, and this tree determines whether you file or not. And, and then the clock is the monkey that rings the bell. Okay. So this is all, all kid stuff. There are two to the eight, 256 local rules. 
Okay, and uh, by the way, uh, can, can I have a show of, uh, how many of you know Gerhard Richter? Well, he's, I'm, I'm surprised, he's, he's a famous painter, one of my favorite. If you go to New York City, go to the Museum of Modern Art, and you will see uh, Gerhard Richter, 298, please. So this, this is amazing, you know, I mean, this, this is one of the famous, uh, uh, mon, most famous painting uh, now, this is modern art. And there are exactly 256 shades of color. So you can think of that, that painting now as the 256 rules, okay? But instead of 256 shades of color for the children, I'm gonna have another way to motivate them, which makes more sense today. Okay, uh, can I go back to, okay. All right, now, but let's ask the question, of how would a kid, you know, it, it doesn't make much sense to tell the kids that these are 256 rules, but who, who creates the rule, you know? It's not Moses, you know? And, and, and the, but the way that Wolfram did, is, is, and, and all the people here or Thomas, is that these are just, just given, you know? They don't care about where it came from. You know, it's carved, carved one stone. All it's, it's just pulling rabbit out of hat. So to be more, more made, made, I decided that I'm gonna have to, de De develop a cell that's independent and, and that would capture everything. And simple enough, everybody can understand. Of course, the kids wouldn't understand and differentiate equations, but for you guys here, I had derived a single one scalar differentiation equation on the right hand side. You can see that uh, Y is the output, and you have three input, uh, two inputs, I mean, three including yourself, and you have coefficient. Uh, the blue ones are the coefficient. There are eight coefficients that you can determine. It's the same equation, but by picking the eight coefficients according to a table that I have, you can execute any one of those 256 rules. For example, the most complicated one is when all eight numbers are not zero. And by the way, I call this a stem cell because it's very similar to, to, to a human stem cell. And, uh, the, and, as, and as I said, the, the, the most complicated case is case three, k equal to three. Uh, a few minutes from now, you see that I call that the index of complexity. So index three, you would need eight coefficients. Index two, you need only six. Index one, only four. And 137 would turn out to be index two, okay? And uh, now I have a table, as I said, and I'm just showing one page of that table, and, and, and it lists all the numbers from zero to 255. So for, two, for 137, for example, you look at that, that it was, you have six numbers. Those are the numbers that you plug into the equation and outcomes that that cell is gonna, is gonna ex execute 137, for example. And the interesting thing is this is one simple cell. You, you can actually uh, easily make a, a mass production of a standalone circuit. You don't need the, the Toshiba chip. You just, just, just have that one cell and you would have you know, millions of them. In fact, I, that's one of the things that I hope that children uh, would be able to access to this and, and they would be able to, to understand what's going on much, much more motivated. So if you think of eight dimensional parameter space, by putting in eight different numbers, uh, 256 different numbers, each one corresponds to one rule, you can think of this uh, whole thing we're talking about is just one equation with 256 different set of parameters. And again, just to, to see the similarity, a stem cell can be programmed to function as any type of cell in the human body, as you know. And, and uh, for my case here, I, I call this now a new universal neuron with three synapses. And it, a universal, universal CNN neuron can be programmed to implement any one of the 256 local rules. And of course, you also know that there are many different types of cells in, the human, in our human body, in your body, my body. Each type of cells can give rise by cell division to only cells of the same type. So, so it's just like a CNN, once you pick this set of eight numbers, you can only do that rule, okay? So for example, a liver cell can never give rise to a heart cell or to a neuron, okay? And now, it, it's interesting that there are, believe it or not, there are 256 different cell types in humans. You know, it's just, just a coincidence. And we have 256 local rules for cell automata, which is, which is just a fluke here, but it's the same number. And now I'm gonna tell you how, how I'm gonna teach the kids. So instead of, and also the whole basis of Mathematica, the, the, the revision I, I developed, is based on the fact that I, I, I can use mathematics, whereas Wolfram is all discrete type, like on top. 
The top truth table is all in zero, and they are symbolic. You can call it yes, no, or high, low, and you cannot manipulate it. You cannot solve anything. So the way to do this, right, is to do this real number. So instead of zero, I call it minus one. And one is plus one. So, so that's the same thing. It's just, you can say it's just a change of symbol. But the difference here is that now the symbol is real numbers. And I can have anything in between as well. And now, by virtue of the fact that I use minus one and plus one, you can actually locate these eight roots as the coordinate of eight vertices center at, at this, at, you know, at, in, in that diagram. So, so you, you have a cube sitting you know, with a center at the origin of the cube. And uh, the coordinates of these eight vertices are exactly this eight, eight, eight uh, pattern. And then the output will be color. Uh, so this would be the, 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 I call this, by the way, of, as you can see, the location of the 64 uh, of, of the eight vertices. And it has this uh, weight on each one of them. And those are the, when, it, when the firing pattern is red, that's the weight that you would add, add on to get the number of the rules. So it's all very trivial. I call this a Boolean cube, okay? And for each rule, you just color the corresponding vertices, the red, uh, whenever, whenever it's firing pattern, okay? So for example, 137 would have that, that uh, firing pattern here. And, and I, uh, you know, I have this one he, uh, here, which is exactly that, that, that firing pattern. They got three red ones exactly located. So, the, so imagine now you have 256 of these cubes. And this could be made, you know, I, I could imagine there could be a business set up here where th these are all just plastic toys. You have 256 of them, each one with a different pattern. 137 is, is that. And the right side below that is the equation, because remember now I have equation for everything, every of 256 rule, and that parameter is now supplied for this 137. How many have you been to Brussels? Have you seen, if, if not, the next time you go there, this is still there. Uh, it's, 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 it's called the Atomium. And this is exactly the model that I have here. In fact, it, you can see it, uh, it's a huge structure with the cars below. It's a museum now. And, and, uh, and, and the center is that thing in there. So, so we're talking about, about the, the, Russia do this in the exhibition many, many years ago. And this is the, the, the symbol, uh, the element iron and is exactly what, what it is. So, we, uh, so we're talking about the, 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 the bullying cube here. That's exactly. The, the iron, uh, iron, okay? All right, so we now have a zoo of 256 uh, uh, bullying, bullying cube, and, and so you can now list all of them, and, and I have a table, table, all of that. You can see there's just two pages here. So this is all kid stuff now. They, every one of them is, is just a different color. Imagine now with the real kids, we, I hope there'll be uh, uh, plastic uh, things, 256 of them they can play with, okay? And now you notice that there are three colors. And I'll show you why there are three colors, because colors one, two, three, OK? And the, if you look at, for example, this particular rule 170, uh, you, can, you, can, you can pass a plane that will separate all the blue vertices from the red vertices. So, so there are many rules that have this property. So a single plane will cut it. So all those rules that has a property, I call it index one, or index of complexity one, OK? So, so uh, Wolfram also tried to classify different things, but he was all using uh, uh, imperial simulation. So, so you can, they're always fuzzy area. You don't know where, where it should be one or two. So here's an example. This would be index one. If you can separate the, the, the vertex by, by one plane. And uh, 137, you can separate with two planes, because, because otherwise you, you, there will be something in between. So you need two planes. This would be index two. And 184 is the third. Uh, please remember this 80, 184 and 137 because we're going to use them extensively in next lecture. And you see fascinating thing. There are all kinds of things in physics, in quantum mechanics, that these two rules actually would, would do exactly the same thing and, and, and much more sensible because you can see, you know, it's, it's the abstract. So it would turn out that all 256 rules would belong to one of these three types. And, and those are the color code. It belongs to, say, uh, uh, index two, it would be blue, OK? That's why you see those 256 cubes with three different colors. And I, I believe that you will agree that all the kids can do this, OK? We, this would be a simple exercise. Ask them to give them 256 cubes, group them into three groups. You know, that, that would be the very simple thing that kids can do, really kids stuff.
So this, when they do that, you can now ask them to fill up the table. Or, or they turn out the 100 follow the two from the 256 that are all index one. You can separate it with only one, 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 one surface, you know. And, and those are the 250, uh, uh, 104 of them. There are 126 that needs two, two planes to separate. They are blue. So those are the numbers. If you add them, and then there's the remaining there, 26 will be index three. Okay? And so if you add, say, the first two, you see it covered most of the thing. And then finally, all of them would be, when, when included with two, 256, that's why you have three colors. And this is all stuff that kid, uh, school actually can do. But quite amazingly, uh, in 1997, a very distinguished uh, professor from Italy, his name is Professor Catenio, published a 25-page paper and considered to be a very outside, you know, w widely referenced paper. And he was so intru in intrigued that they, he called the word the magic rule. You know, and, and in this 25 page, he used a very advanced mathematics. You have to have some abstract linear algebra. It, it, I'm giving you read it, you, you see what I mean. It's non trivial. And he was, when it's all done, he was so impressed with his result because it essentially showed that there are rules, uh, see, rules that can do the perceptron. You remember the perceptron early on that the, the, uh, the, 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 the per, Infamous book, remember, with distinguished between that's called perceptron. There are hundred four. After this huge analysis, math, mathematical analysis, they found, found out that you net exactly hundred four rules that had this property. But he was so excited about it, and, and he is he, magic, so he called it magic. Okay. Now these are the hundred four rules that is published by this paper with very advanced mathematics. But now you compare with. 104 that the kid children can do with no mathematics is exactly the same set. So I've just convinced you that, that school age children can derive exactly the same result, okay? Uh, and and that's, that's the, without any mathematics, okay? And so, so magic in for Catania is now index one for us, okay? Now, Wolfram's book is sort of based on brute force computer simulation, as I keep emphasizing. And so, so what he does is he, he starts with, with a rule number. And then he, he would uh, put an initial con condition, and he would always pick a single red picture in the, in the meter, and all blue. Th 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 so so uh, he was motivated. He was braced as a linear person, obviously. Uh, and most engineers, too. We, we were taught in linear system that all you need to do is put in one impulse, see what the response. And once you have done, you can predict everything else for any other input, right? So that was the classic thing everybody learned. But, it turns out that this linearized, you know, then, then analog is really a bad habit, especially for cellular automata. Okay, and and it's about the worst signal testing system you can do. But Wolfram did it, and he did it for every one of those 256. And for, so and the reason he did it is because he wanted to compare so for the same input. What are how how the other rules? Uh, how how do we how how can he decide which one is more complicated in what sense? That's that's goal. So in terms of the monkeys. We're talking about a, a, a single monkey uh, with a red flag. Everybody else will be blue, and the kids certainly can understand that. Okay, and now I'm going to go through a few examples uh, quickly. So to start with the simplest one, you can see the bullying cube here is all red vertices except one zero on the far corner, and and so that could translate into that that uh, eight bit word with a single blue. All all the rest are firing pattern. And also, we, we, now, we picked, uh, as in Warfram, uh, 21 bits, just so I can show it uh, here. And, and so we start with always the first row is a single red picture in the center, and start to iterate, OK? So you can see that, that, that it, it, it evolves down. And that's called space, uh, <coughs> space time uh, uh, pattern, OK? So it, in this simplest case, this is how it developed. In fact, uh, you can, uh, so this is called space time pattern. And the pro main problem, fundamental problem addressed by this book is that given a local rule, one by 256 rule, the one you just saw is the simplest one, in, okay? Uh, given any one of you want to predict the behavior, uh, after a long time, you, can, you would like to be able to hopefully say that after a, a, a million iteration or maybe after 50 iteration, uh, what he's going to see, okay? So in this case, it turned out to be simple. It can turn out that. Uh, after about 10 iterations, uh, where, 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 you know, where it, every row is different, I call that a transient, transient regime. 
And, and for this rule, after a 10 iteration, you can see that they become repeat, repetitive. So, so, so that's the simplest. It's, uh, we call that in nonlinear time a period one, periodic one, just keep repeating, or a period one rule. And so that's the first thing that the kids can learn what's a period one rule, just by doing this experiment. And there are many, uh, uh, something like 67 of all rules that are period one rules, for example. So that's something the kids can do, you know, ask them to find all the period one rules. Uh, then the, the space time uh, pattern, uh, and also, so as I said, this is called period one rules. And let's go back to, to, to uh, look, look at this uh, picture here. You can see that, that uh, all the, in the transient regime, it, it, every, every row is different. And so forth. but when it gets to the steady state, uh, it, it repeats, right? So, so we, you can, this is called an attractor. So the kids can understand that, that this is like a magnet. You know, they, they attract, any of the previous particles will be attracted toward, toward it. So they, they learn what is, is our tractor was period one, okay? And now, uh, so, so uh, in fact, we can also argue that 254 can be a crude model of the spreading by virus from a single virus in a city and start to spread. So, it, so, so this rules has, has interesting uh, 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 mundane uh, application as well. Go, let's go to the next rule, two, 250. And this 250 is a little bit more complicated. You can see that uh, the, 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 there are five pairing patterns, but two blues on the right, separated by the red one. And after the transient uh, uh, period, you see that it, if you look carefully at the last week row, you see that it actually repeats every other row. Okay, and, and so just to show you that it, it actually repeats, I'm gonna uh, close out the middle one. Now you can see that they are per periodic. But every other row, so that's why it's called period two. So, so, so the kids will first time learn that you can have period two, two rules, okay? And uh, uh, how about this rule of 62? And uh, 62 uh, turns out to have a longer, much longer transition. We all have start with a single bit in the, in the middle. Uh, that's what Wolfram did, so to compare. Okay. Now it took a much longer, for, uh, 45 said before, uh, where, where the transition is, and finally uh, it repeats. And uh, uh, every three times. So I'm going to blow this up so you can see that uh, well, it's not so clear. So I'm going to blow up further and chop up the top up. You can see that the, 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 the black one consists of three rows that I block off. And you, know, you can see that it repeats after two. So this is called pre the three rules. Okay. So, so the kids can all quickly un understand there's such thing as dynamics that could be period one, period two, period three. And now let's follow Wolfram. Uh, pick uh, rules at 90, and, and this is copied from Wolfram's book. Now, it, it turned out that you, you, don't need, you don't get any more periodic rules. It just keep going. Uh, it just keep going like that, no matter how, many, how big the, the array is, keep going. And so Wolfram uh, had a good sense of, sort of uh, zooming in, say, one of them, and he saw that it actually repeats. If you put it in a magnifier, it repeats. And if you put another uh, point in the uh, magnifier one, and you see that it kept magnifying. So he was first one to say this is a fractal, and he was right. Okay, for those of you, who, who, how many of you know fractals? Well, for, for kids, I tell you what fractal is. Just everybody, kids, you know, molten salt. Why is molten salt a fractal? Well, molten salt, you know, I, I just peel up up and, and pick picture. You can see it's carrying, uh, uh, the girl is carrying a, a, a molten salt, and but the molten salt that he carries has a picture of the molten salt, and then so you can magnify that. And that one also has a modern salt, and that next one, and the next one. And just imagine, you, you could do this forever. That's a fractal. That's what a kid can learn, okay? And uh, so, so now, rule 30 is interesting. And, uh, and Wolfram was fascinated by this. Works. Again, always start with a single bit in the middle, and either way, and he suddenly realized that there's no period of any period. And also no fractal that, that like the 90 one that is really neat. It just keep going. And if you just look at the center row, he begins to see that all those bits are, are never repeating. It's, it's, it's random. In fact, he went on many, many more iterations and, and look at the center, it's always, you know, never repeat. So in fact, he, it turned out that this is a, one of the really good uh, random number generator. It's, this is in, in the software that he's u using now, okay? And, and uh, so what the, the rule 30 turned out to be a random number generator, a, a really good one, in fact, that's, that's so simple. But, but uh, Wolfram didn't realize 
and, and, and because this is my, uh, my discovery, that there are, in fact, some weird initial conditions that uh, is periodic, not only period, it's period one. And can I, can I, can I have uh, rule 30, uh, 302? OK. Uh, imagine now a string of alternating pixels. And it's a rubber arm, that it, the, the first initial condition. And, and that's for row 30. And then you keep doing that. That's what you get in the bottom. Every row is the same. So in other words, it's not true that 30 is, is uh, always random. Can, there, there you have. You have one example of row 30. Most people didn't know that, OK? But and I, I have a name for that. That's called the Isles of Eden. This will be a subject for next talk. It's a fascinating thing. There are real rules like that that, that, that you are going to be completely alone, OK? And you know, uh, so, so uh, remember this picture today because tomorrow, tomorrow I mean, next week we're going to come back to it. But I want to show you, show, tell you that Ruth, um, most root have in fact this real isolated things, including thirty that Wolfram thought would, uh, would never have things like that. Okay. For next week too, uh, I have a, I have a reader, uh, and and. Uh, I, 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 I'm, you, would, you won't have time to copy this, but you can look at, at, at the web uh, when you go home. Uh, the answer to this reader is the essence of the next talk. So uh, maybe some of you, has anybody recognized this? Uh, OK, this is before next week. OK, now, uh, <coughs> wait a minute. Uh, can I go back to the beginning? The very first slide? Yeah, not, not where, where I left off. Right. OK, so now this picture that we just seen, this rule 30, was so fascinating to Wolfram, and he was right. In fact, uh, I was surprised that Wolfram would have this sentence in his book. I just copied. He said, this picture that we just seen is the single most surprising scientific discovery I have ever made. Very strong statement. But he was quite right. It, it was, it was uh, uh, you know. And but by the way, for for 21 bit long, uh, it would take 209,000 repetition. If you, you, know, if you, if you restrict to only 21, you work because it never repeats. Okay, and and, and one of them, of course, would be this one that Wolfram didn't know. And uh, but essentially, Wolfram would have to sit through that many things, and, he, uh, and no one would have enough patience to do that, of course. So this is why, if you do brute force simulation, you, you are going to miss so many things. Uh, for example, for 61 bits, you may think 61 bits is, is, is quite short. But if you use a, 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 a PC, uh, say 100 nanosecond time to pick to make one iteration, it would take 7,300 years. If you have 85 bits long, which is quite reasonable, you would have you would need 105 trillion iteration, and by the time you go to 500, it's practically infinity. And 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 Leon Levin said so, and correctly, only math nerds would call two to the 500 finite. Yeah, it's, it's infinite. Okay, so in other words, you you, you don't ever if you if you work from you you quit by the time if you, by the time you pick say say 50 bits that, and then so so you really don't know what's ha what's happening because there are a lot of rules that never repeat. OK? And uh, so the fundamental question I repeat is to given a local rule and, and an initial uh, bit string, you want to predict the qualitative asymptotic behavior and when n go to infinity without having to wait, wait forever. Because, because you, even for 500 bit, you, it will be older than the age of the universe to do that. Okay? It turns out that, that the reason you, that many of these will have this price because girders, you, you have heard, I talked about it briefly, the girders in completeness theorem. This is one instance we can apply it. Girders in completeness theorem implies that it is impossible to predict the outcome of the iteration of an arbitrary cellular automata. You, you know, I, when I pick only one, of course, you can say that, oh, 254, you can tell. But, you know, it's period one. But, out of 250, if, if I pick any one of them, it's impossible to, to, to predict uh, the outcome uh, of the iteration of an arbitrary cellular automata starting from an arbitrary initial uh, input. Okay? So now, so therefore, uh, uh, 
uh, we need to do something simpler. You can say that, oh, there are 256 rules, but some wise guys, are including, how many of you know uh, uh, <coughs> Kersile? The Doug Kersile, you know, one of the Silicon Valley genius. Uh, in fact, when he first saw this, he, 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 he wrote a review and he said, oh, Wolfram doesn't have to work through 256 rules. All, all he needs to do, half of that, you know, because there's a, there, 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 there is, the complement of that, so it's like 110. If you change the, 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 out, the, the, the right column, you can see, make it all the complement color. So you can see that, that you can say, of course, you, you, you don't have to work hard for 256, you just do half of them, okay? But uh, even though, uh, now these are called complementary rules. So for example, all of this uh, thing on the left, you can see they are complements, okay? So, so what he, what Kurt said, said, you know, it seemed to make sense, you know? Why do you have to repeat 256, when half of them, it's going to be the complement. Well, it turned out that that was actually in, in, uh, in, uh, not quite correct because let's take uh, like 145 and 110 again. You can see that they are the complement in the color. So you start with, uh, with uh, a red bit in the center. The next iteration, yeah, one, on the left you get blue and on the right you get right. So you will say, of course, that, that's obvious. That's what Kurt will say. But look what happened. Just the next bit. It's different already. So, so he was wrong. Uh, the, this this, this uh, complement works only for one iteration, and after that, it's, it's not true, true anymore. Okay? And, and if you continue that, you can see it's totally different, even though they, they are complementary. So, so, in, so what Kurt was, the mistake was, he didn't realize that local symmetry does not imply global symmetry. It's only good for one iteration. Okay? Now I'm going to show you something that I discovered. Yeah, in, in a, but and it's quite it's quite fundamental for today's talk. Okay, look at 137. I keep using that because that's going to be our main main topic of, uh, next time as well. And the complement of that is 110. You can see that the color are complementary, corresponding vertices complement. And and if you start from the same initial bit, you do get something that exactly complement. But if you look at these two cubes, they are not, they are not complementary, okay? I mean, they, you can see that, that, that they, are, they, are, they, are, they are bit, they are British that are not complementary. So, so that tells you that there are, there are certain rules or certain operations that will actually give you this global complement if you know how to pick them. You see how to pick them. The kids will know how to pick them, by the way. So it's that simple. But I, will, I won't tell you a secret yet. So this global symmetry, the question, what transformation give this, local, this global symmetry? Before I give you an answer, I'll tell you that there are other global symmetry. For example, 124 and 110. If you look at these two cubes, I don't see at least any, any relationship. You know, they're, they're different. You know, I, uh, there's no symmetry that I can, I can detect. Okay. Yet, if I start with this initial condition in center and I iterate them, naturally I get that. The next one, I get that next one, and I keep going, and I'm gonna blow it up now. Still the same, forever. It'll be, it, it, I, you know, it's like a Taj Mahal, completely symmetrical, okay? Yet, the, if you look at these two bowling cubes, or you look at these two worlds then, there's absolutely no obvious reason why they would give that. There's a secret to that as well, as I, of course, I, obviously, the kids can do that, just to tell you how, you know, once you know the, the secret, you know, you don't need mathematics, okay? Although when I do this, I, I use mathematics to derive it, but the kids doesn't need to have that. How about the next one? Look at, look at uh, 193 and 110. Again, look at the, the world. There, there, there's, there's absolutely no, no relationship of, in terms of symmetry. Oh, look at the two cubes. I, I cannot, for, for the hell, see any, any connection, uh, you know, how they are related. There's no symmetry, in, in, you know. So in other words, what I'm saying is that there are certain symmetries that are hidden. If you just know, have to know how to find it. But in this case, you keep iterating, you get a kind of a Taj Mahal thing, except that after you do that, you change color. This is global symmetry. So, the, uh, so this uh, just more more pictures. You can see it's it's, it's it's universal. So to summarize what I've just shown you, is that. For the same initial condition, initial pattern, if I keep iterating, for 110, I get the one on top and the right. For 137, the one on the right bottom. Upper left is 124, and 193 is up, low down. 
you can see that all of them are, are symmetrical with either just a flip of, 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 of a lateral flip or a change of color, which means that if I know the answer to one of them, I can find the answer to the other three. You don't have to work hard to do four of them. Just do one. That, that's the message I'm telling you now, OK? And now the question is, what I, by the way, this is, I introduced a symbol on top. The T is a transformation. The global transformation that does the left-right transform is that dagger. So the dagger is, 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 you know, has a left, right, transform. I pick the dagger to indicate that. The, the one below, we, uh, from 110 to 137, is T with a bar. Bar normally is used for complement. Indeed, that's a global complement. And then the diagonal is T with asterisks. So I have three transformations you know, that will do the global thing, OK? And it, it, I started with mathematics, and I came, finally came up with the three transformation. And it's interesting. It took me a while to realize it. You, you have three input. You think that you should need just three transformation. You will never get it right, and, and, but you will need actually four transformation. Time should be one of them, in fact. So a bit like Einstein, you know, uh, in relativity, he needs a four-dimensional space-time transformation. We do need the same thing. So now, I would, uh, so, so now I've shown you that there are four mathematical transformations, which, of course, you cannot teach the kids. But just to tell you that this is all rigorous, uh, because I, can, I proved them, that you will, you will, you will, with this three transformation, you will get all the symmetry that I've just shown, the three, the three kinds of symmetry. Okay? But for the kids, that, they don't need that. They, because Why? Because I have a way to explain to the kids. So what, let's start with, with uh, the left-right transform. I call it the, the dagger is left-right transform, the Taj Mahal thing. Okay? So this is, the rule is very simple. I tell the kids that if, if you, you are given a, 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 a Boolean rule, say 110 on the left, the, the, the left-right transform of that is obtained by as follow. You, you draw a diagonal. You put a mirror, a double-sided mirror on diagonal. And you look at the, the pair on the left and the right, the color. And you just switch, you, you just reflect the color. So, so the, you copy the diagonals here. And then the, 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 uh, the first pair on the left, you reflect the color which are both red. So that's why it's, it's 6, 4. And the one on the right, 3, 1, you, you reflect the color of 6, 4, and it's 3, 1. It's that simple. And once the kids does that, and every school and children can do that, he'll, he'll pick out that left-right cube, that was the left-right transform, and then he will look at his table, and he'll see that's 124. OK, so it's that simple. And what about the global complement? Well, that's also a simple rule. You look at, uh, the, you look at diagonal pairs. There are four diagonal pairs. So, so, so look at uh, 2, 5 on the left. OK, it's one of the, one of the four diagonal pairs. As long as the diagonal pair have the same color, you would change color. So red, red become blue, blue. OK, so 1, 6, for example, is, is another diagonal that have the same color. You change 1, 6 from red to blue. OK, okay? And, and but there are some pairs like, uh, what is, first of all, 0, 7. It's also diagonal, same color. You change that, the red, red. But one, what, 3 and 4, 3 and 4 has different color. It's the diagonal. And when you have different color, you don't change. So you can see 3 and 4, you don't change. That's the rule. I think you agree that children can do that, OK? So you will get this correct global complement of 110. And, and then he will look at this table uh, that he, he has. Uh, he will identify that's 137. These are the first fundamental result today. It is that there are three fundamental transformations that allows you to do that. And then, of course, uh, it's, it, I, I tabulated all these things just for my own. So, so for any rule, I have uh, three, uh, for, for any rule, I have three other that are global equivalent. Okay, and and uh, but because of spatial symmetry, some of these will repeat. So instead of four, there some of the rules have only two because they they repeat. But everything is tabulated. And this is a table that will be an assignment for the children. They, they can construct that, OK? So as this uh, 256 cubes, including the color, these are all exercises. But, but the kids will really learn a lot. And they will learn about the phenomena. And, and so these are the, 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 the list I just showed you, OK? OK, so now, uh, among them, I pick up one interesting one, like rule 30.
Well, Rule 30, by virtue of the fact that, that, that it has three other equivalent, it's, a, it's 86, 135, and 149. So not, it's not just 30, it's, it's, a, it's a great random number generator. So it's 86, uh, 135, 40, because they're exactly the same property, okay? So, so you can see there a lot of application. Now mathematically, it turned out, I found out that if you, you can create multi multiplication table, the, f the physicists of mathematical code is a group theory. Group theory. So you, you list the four transformations, T sub zero, by the way, is the identity. Identity transformation, I, I call it T zero, along the diagonal. And if you now put in this multiplication table, you multiply each pair, you fill in the corresponding transformation, you see that it fits perfectly, you have a, what's called a multiplication table. This is a group, one of the simplest group, and it was first discovered many years ago by, by uh, Felix Klein, because it's German, it's called Führer group, you know, it stands for four group. And um, Felix Klein is the one who first named it, okay? And so the Führer group, in other words, mathematically now, I'm talking about solid mathematics now, you can say a mathematician, or Felix would say that, that this group partitioned the 256 local rules into 88 equivalent costume. Why? Because you, with this table here, and, and this is what the kids can do. You ask the kids, go down the, there, and they pick out any of this rule that has not been repeated in the, you know, that's not listed, because you, you want to pick out the independent one. And by the time it's done, you find out there were only 88 out of 256 that are independent. That's what Wolfram should do, that he didn't realize. He didn't have to go through 256 or to one, uh, 27 as Kurt's advice, you know, uh, because he only needs 88, which is, which is a great saving of effort. And, and every, anybody interested in cell automata, this is all you need to do, okay? And these are the 88 rules, by the way, okay? And, and they're all different colors. Uh, can, can I have the pitch up high? Uh, 263. Uh, yeah, so imagine now you have a pizza pie. You divide it, I'm gonna show you now that what we're gonna do. We can divide that pizza pie, there, there are 88 rules, and all, you know, because we, we now know that you only need 88 rules. A great saving of work, okay? But we don't know how, how are these 88 rules partitioned. So think about pizza pie with six different flavors, okay? And, and uh, turn out that out of, out of the 88, a big chunk of them, 25, are all period one. And this is all the kids can, 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 can discover. 20, so the kids will first list them, and you know, that's another exercise, find the 80, list the 88 rules so that he can forget about the, the other uh, rules. And if out of his 88, he can immediately identify, or he will be, she will, they will be able to identify 25. School and children can do that. They can certainly identify the period two. It turns out that there are only two rules that are period three and period six. That's a tiny slice of that. And then there is a root, there are 30 of them. In fact, the, the, the biggest pie is 30. It's called Bernoulli, sigma tau shift root that I'm gonna go uh, 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 later on today. This is fun fundamental, okay? And, it turn, and, and the good news is it is so neat and so simple and yet it's fundamental. And they're the biggest chunk. You will love it. It's called a Bernoulli rule. Uh, how many of you have heard Bernoulli name before? Great. It's, well, it's interesting. I'm going to tell you about the family of Bernoulli. Okay? It's an interesting family. And, you know, uh, but this is a particular Jacob, Jacob Bernoulli is the one I'm talking about here. And I have six symbol, sigma tau. There are two integers, sigma and tau. Tau is an integer, it's one, two, three, four, five. Sigma is also integer, but it could be positive, negative. Plus one or minus one, plus two, minus two. It would turn out that that's all you need to be able to predict. Out of the 88, 30 of them predict exactly what's going to happen. The kids can do that, okay? Yeah. Now, by the way, you can go back and, and, and now that you know the equivalent, uh, you can, you can go, go back to all 56 and reclassify all of them, but that, that's a waste of time. We, can, we, we should just look at, we should just look at the, the 88 one because that's all you need, all you need to do, okay? All right. So, uh, Okay, uh, it turned out that, that, that uh, as I said, there are 88 out of C that are, that are independent, those are the 88, and, but each one of these has either four equivalent or just two because of additional symmetry, and 
And as I say, if you are equivalent, then you need to know only one, and the others can be predicted. Okay? It turns out that this is one. This is the only major, only result in Wolfram's book, and in fact, the the, the real important re is Rule One Ten. Okay? And and it, it it is turned out to be a universal Turing machine. This is a big deal. You know, I mean, nobody would imagine uh, uh, this is the case. Uh, Wolfram had a great insight uh, early on that this could be a universal Turing machine. But he was not able to prove it. Okay? And so uh, when he was writing this book, he, 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 he had a, a, a mathematics student from Caltech that was working for him. And his name is Matthew Cook. Uh, it, he, so he asked Matthew Cook to try to prove it because he's a mathematician. Okay? And uh, it turned out that Matthew Cook actually gave up in, in early on. And then, uh, so, so Wolfram has a lot of contribution here. He sort of, sort of uh, inspired him to say, come on, go on, you know, this is what you, you might want to do. It turned out that, that, he, that he eventually he proved it. So, so even though Wolfram didn't prove it, it was, it was Matthew Cook, but Wolfram had a lot of contribution. Okay? And the proof was, was by Matthew Cook. Uh, but uh, Matthew Cook is still working for PhD office, was so excited. He, he knows that this for posterity, he wants to be remembered as a person who proved 110 is universal Turing machine. So he went out to give a lecture or, 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 or even want to publish a paper. And, 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 and uh, this created a sort of a, a problem. Uh, Wolfram sued him, okay? Because uh, I, which, which is legal, when you get employed, you sign an agreement that you're not supposed to say anything or publish anything. I'm sure you did too, you know. And, but uh, Matthew Cook obviously is willing to go to jail so to keep his name to be the one who proved 110, and he still is, okay? And, so he now, uh, well, the, it's been settled. The, they were also been settled. So he had been a, he would publish it. That was the, that was published in uh, uh, 2004. This book was 2002. Okay, so it was published. And and then just in fact a few years ago, 2009, Matthew Cook gave a, a more detailed explanation of the proof. So it's now classic. Okay, now uh, but we know that they are full. Equivalent rules, okay? 110, 124, 137, 190, that's one of the, the four equivalent. We now know 110 is, but so are the other three. And 137 is one of them, okay? So you can pick any one of them, and of course, if you were a C, cellular automata fan, including me, I would pick 110 until I realized that, that 110 is not an easy number to remember. 137 is for a good reason. Having to do with quantum mechanics and physics and number theory, and and so that's the number that I've been using. That's for next talk. Okay, so 137 is a universal Turing machine. Is this number I pick? As I say, any, you can pick any of the three number. Everybody is now today because say 110. Okay, but but I didn't prove this. It, it's proved by Matthew Cook, and but but my virtual fact that I have this theorem that said the equivalent. This is also a universal Turing machine. Okay. So these are the four universal uh, Turing machine, and 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 I, I, I you know and you can see those symbol there at, at, at the transformation the, the left right with the dagger the the one in the middle with a, with a global complement and then with a diagonal the studies are all how they are related, and so um, in fact in my first book I was so uh, through for children I was already thinking about it you know I put a picture uh, the four musketeers. Okay, because these are the, 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 perhaps the most important result of this book, and rightfully so. No one, in it, including me, would imagine that you can have a simple, single line, set automata, that is a universal Turing machine. Again, for those of you who may not know what a universal Turing machine is, it's, it's, it's why it's important. To say you have a universal Turing machine in the present context means that any program that you write, no matter how big, and, 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 and that you need a supercomputer. You wrote this program, okay? And you solve a great problem. You give me that program. I can find, I can pick 137. Okay, I can do that. And I can pick the initial part. The whole thing is I can translate. There's a way of translating from that program that you wrote. I will translate a, a string, of course, a very long one. And that string will be the initial condition, and I keep iterating. And at some point, it will stop. And that answer, when it stops, that answer is the answer 
that you got from a supercomputer. So in other words, it's as powerful as a supercomputer. This is why it is such an important concept, OK? But of course, no, no one would be able to do that, because we're talking about you know, a trillion bits of 137. But conceptually, that's what it means, OK? So that's the main result. Uh, some of you who might want to have a short introduction, um, Professor Meinzer and I, uh, well, again, it was written by Meinzer. Uh, it's a small, skinny book by Springer in 211. It's called The Universe as Automata. Okay. And uh, so lecture 12, before I quit, you know, who is the next lecture, is going to be called 137 is a Magic Number. It's not just about 137. It's a lot more other interesting thing. But 137 is something that you, you would want to remember for the rest of your life. Okay. And so the end code uh, is the whole is more than the sum of its part. And you have seen many times the lectures on complexity theory. You have, you have single, if you take a single cell, uh, it, it's not interesting. Take a single, take a single neuron, it's not interesting. cannot do anything. Take a single ant, what can a single ant do? It would just, just, just uh, uh, randomly, walk randomly, you know, it's not, not interesting. But you put enough of them together, the whole suddenly exhibit complexity. So, so Aristotle was he's ingenious. He, he, he stated that in his time, OK? Uh, so, so now I think I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, can I have that reader again one more time, 304? Because 304, the, the answer to this reader is going to be the central theme of next week's lecture, OK? And, and I, I, I'm sure some of you would have recognized this this paragraph, but, but if not, uh, Google it. If you just type in this line, you know, it'll tell you what the answer is. That's going to be for, for, for next week. So uh, with this, I'm going to stop and, and ask for questions. And, and after that, uh, if we have remaining time, I'm going to go on to something quite interesting uh, that would give you a lot more insight. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Any questions? I have one. Yes. Um, what about larger numbers of inputs? So real a, a cellular automata, like a neuron. Yeah, many. Have, can, right. Can have many. Yeah. Well, the, all of these things. This whole book is is just this one case. Two left and right. Just just three inputs. Okay. And and uh, of course, uh, one would imagine that the number you might be more complicated. But what's fa fascinating is Wolfram had found again. This is not a theorem, but he had found to his many, many nights of, 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 of uh, computer simulation. He seemed to say that, they, 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 that if you have more number, you, you basically don't get anything new. That was not a theorem, but, but, but there is some truth to that. So in some sense, this is the most elementary, and that's the good news. You only need to know this. And certainly, the, I, I hope that you agree that much of what I just said, in fact, including what I will say later on, the kids can be, school children can be taught, you know, with sufficient motivation, and they will learn about period one, period two, period three. They will even learn about chaos and dynamics, attractor, all of these things. And, 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 and these are things that, that even high school kids don't know, okay? And, and, but, but there's nothing, nothing, no background needed to understand the natural phenomena, which is highly nonlinear, okay? Any other, any other question? Um, could you explain what the, the T star uh, so, so, transformation? Say it again, please. What was the T star transformation? T with an asterisk? Oh, with asterisks? Yeah. There, there are three transformations. You, you know the, the left right transform, the Taj Mahal, and the global complement is, is uh, just, just uh, the complement, the color, okay? The asterisk is just one after, the, it's a composition. You do asterisk first. And then you do the complement, or, or vice versa. That transformation is the three star. So in, in some sense, there are only really two fundamental ones. Okay? So the, the first one is you just, you, you just, you just go the Boolean cube. You, 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 you reflect the diagonal, the color. That will give you the left-right transform. If, if you want to get the uh, global complement, 
you look at the diagonal pairs. Those that have the same color, you change color. That will give you that. If you want to get the asterisk, you, you do that, and then you do, you, you do the next one. Let's say you start with the left right transform, you get something, and then you do the uh, global complement, you get another thing. That's the composition in mathematics, and you know, one after the other is the third one. So in Sanskrit, there are only two, okay? And, and together there are three, plus identity, follow, and that's why you have the four group. That's the simplest group that you learn from group theory. And it, that is the fundamental group that explains this, that creates really the foundation. You know, um, the, the, all of this stuff you now is well founded. Uh, so, so this is a great book. And, and with the time, in spite of the fact that of the shortcomings and all the criticism, this, this is such a great book. And I, I, I recommend it. It's, it's very cheap too. I think it, it, I just count, it costs less than three cents a page. Okay? You can, you know, you can use it for, uh, for weight if you, for anything else. Okay? All right. Um, it seems like there's a lot of connection to group theory. You know, like if you have, you know, like seven elements in a group, and then you have only certain subgroups. It's like if there's seven because it's prime, you can only have one or seven. Um, and you know, if it's six, you can have two, three subgroups. Um, has presumably there's subgroup structure to these things and how do they map on to those categories that you have because it seems like you've got a certain number of elements and you should have a certain number of mm -hmm. subgroups yeah. and yeah you, you you're absolutely right uh, that, 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 that if you learn something about groups there are all kinds of uh, uh, subgroups that you can generate but I haven't spent time to do that but I can tell you but I told you there are six volumes of this thing if you look at just volume one and two there are many many more things that I didn't talk about there are symmetry symmetry they, they, these cubes are really has many other symmetry that, that I, but they're not fundamental for today, so, so I didn't even mention them, okay? And from those symmetry, you can see there are subgroups and all kinds of things. So, so, so I said, I have six volumes because I, I, I have a lot of details in there. It was written really for sophomores, you know? Not, when you talk about group, you can't teach that to children anymore, you know? But, but you don't need those additional embellishment. Uh, the, the school children, I could imagine that some entrepreneurs really can create a little company, just make you know, some Lego thing, to, uh, 256 of this, and then create a whole, a, whole, a whole subject that would really get this area open, and it doesn't cost much to do that. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on to... Oh. I was going to ask a question. Oh, there another question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Um, when you were talking about the uh, complementation, you said if the diagonal is the same color, then you change the color. Yeah. But the, the, this is the global complement transformation. Uh, and okay, I, there, there's, there are four diagonals of the cube. So I just noticed. The opposite, the opposite diagonal, there are, are four pairs. Yeah. Yeah. So you look at each pair. Yeah. And if they have the same color, the, the, the complement is going to be the opposite color. You change color. Right. But there are some pairs that, may, that are uh, red and blue. In that case, don't, you keep those color. You don't change it. Yes. That's, that, that's, that's the procedure. OK. But okay. So, I I, so the kids can do that, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I noticed, though, with at least between uh, 137 and 110, which is one of those uh, pairs where you do the complement, yeah. you, can, you can go between those by rotating the bits. Is that the same thing? I mean, is it just a coincidence that? No, I didn't say any rotating the bits. You know? I'm, I'm just telling you how, how to implement this, this transformation. And, and you can perhaps observe other kind of symmetry. But, but I didn't want to compliment them. I'm just telling you exactly what it takes to do the global complement is you look at the four pairs, diagonal pairs. Yeah. And you change color if, for every pair that have the same color. That's simple as that. So okay? it, it just seemed like if you swap bits seven and zero and yeah. six and one and, and five yeah, yeah. and if, two. If, if it says zero, one, become one, zero. Okay. You just, uh, no, no. If it's the same color, say zero, one, then you keep it. If it's, if, I mean, if it's opposite color, let's say zero and one, a diagonal, a pair. 
then you do that, it just keeps zero in one. Yeah. But if you have zero, zero in one of those pairs, you change that to one, one, and vice versa. Okay. That's, that's, what the, that's the global complement. Okay? Okay, now let me move on to, uh, can, I, can I have 201? So this is part two of, uh, now let's go back to, as I said, Wolfram sort of, uh, his, his book is all empirical. So he tried to classify, you know, this 256 rule. Just imagine he, he spent you know, 10 years, by the way, writing, working on, and, and so, so I, you can imagine he's sitting in front of the computer late at night, you know, won't do, maybe go through the whole night because things become exciting. He keep watching, see what may happen. And, and on, on his side, now that he will kick himself if he realized that, that he only did for, did for 88 of them. Okay, he didn't have to go through all 256. But, but that, that was on his side, you know. I mean, he didn't know about it. But the point is, because of this empirical thing, because he didn't have a theory, he didn't have a foundation, and I'm not knocking him at all. He, he has immense cont you know, contribution. It's just that he didn't have the right background to do, to do this thing right, okay? And so he tried to classify them, these 256 groups, into different groups that he said have similar properties. Uh, but what, what do you mean by similar? Well, he, Wolfram didn't have a theory, so he, he, his classification is what I call taxonomy. You know, if you're a zoologist, that's what you do. You know, you, in the days before DNA, what do you do? You, you look at uh, things that are look the same. You have seen that already, the horseshoe crop. And the crop, they, they, you know, right? they, they look the same, so, so they would cost, consider the same class. But with DNA, we now know that you know, horseshoe crop is, is record, is, and belong to a spider family. So just similarity is not a good scientific way to group things in the same group. That's what I'm saying. For example, the rhinoceros and the horse, no one in his right mind would say that they are, they are the same family. You know, I'm, if you were a taxonomist, then before DNA, they, they, they actually are classified completely differently, rightfully. Then now they are family, they are the same. Uh, species, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that, and secondly, so that was the one problem with Wolfram. And secondly, he picked the wrong uh, initial uh, bit. This is about the, this is perfect bit testing bit for uh, linear system. Is the worst bit you can do for nonlinear, okay? So I invented a, a, a test, a good test string to pick, okay? And this is uh, called the super, super string, okay? And, and uh, you can see that, so that again, this is for kids stuff. So I picked a symbol that the old kids start playing piano, okay? So, so this is the symbol for the super string. That's gonna be my testing signal. How do you, how do you define that? The, the kids can learn it immediately. So that's how, what you do. Uh, it's, so you start with, you tell the kids, you start with, with two, with, with other, you have two bits, so you have zero or one. That's the only possibility, right? I mean one bit, zero or one. Then you can, it's like two bits, only four possibilities, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Go to three bits, you got now eight possibilities listed. You go to four bits, and you now have 16. You go to five bit, and I, I end up with only in this type to with six bit, you got, uh, you know, 64, 32, six, 64 bits there. Now you can continue this process. So this, this string is, is just as good, run on, run on. This bit string, is what I call a super string, okay? Now, of course, in, in, in real test, I, I, I will truncate somewhere, you know, but, but, but it's infinitely better than a single red bit, you know, that Wolfram did. And turn out that that's good enough for what I'm doing here. But a super string, my definition is simply just this, it, it, you know, it, it, and, and everybody can remember that. So it's just, again, this, this you have a tape with a color, for, you have red, blue, and then you have, you have uh, uh, four of the uh, two, Two, two bits and then uh, eight of the, uh, of, of the two bits, etc. Et That's a super string, okay? And, and now, why is it in, in uh, a, a reason about uh, te testing uh, uh, initial condition? Well, it's because this uh, super string contains all finite bit strings as substrings. And just because I, I, I do, I just do it, keep, keep going. So, so, no, so if, you, if you give me, say, a 15-bit, give me 15-bit of, of any combination, red, blue, you want, I, all you need to do is just go down this string, go to 15-bit section, 
and you're going to see one of it's going to be one of them. So so every partial bit is included. So I like to show this uh, cartoon from some uh, some that I pick up some somewhere, and uh, so imagine that uh, your grandma in years from now is going to be writing binary letters, not not words anymore. It's just been trained all binary, okay? So that's a binary letter, okay? Now this binary letter is going to be in the, it's going to be in this super string. Why? Well, let's say you have a, a, you know a ten thousand words in this. I mean, a, a, a thousand words in this page here. You, you go down to that bit string, super string, and you're going to see one section that's 1,000 bit long. It will be one of these is the letter, okay? Just to, just to prove that, that everything is included in the super string. That's my testing signal, okay? So I have a theorem. The, the super string is the ideal testing signal for one dimensional cellular automata, okay? And uh, now I'm going to, so, when I say I, by the way, these are done by my students uh, some 10 years ago. And so we, we, we started to do the project. So we do some like Wolfram did, but we use a super string instead of the single bit uh, in the middle. Okay? And then classify them. So, so for example, for rule 140, as an example, and, and you always start off with some transient. See, in the beginning, there are only some, some junks. Well, I call junks, these are the transient part. But sooner or later, for, for, for lost rules, our period one, period two, period three, it's going to stop somewhere, and it begins periodic, period one, period two, period three, et cetera. So, so this is uh, uh, obtained from the super string, just a, you know, a short one. Uh, but as I said, it's better than, than a uh, single bit. Okay? So out of this effort, it turned out that, that, that uh, there are 67 out of 256, a huge chunk of them, that are uh, all period one, and they're all listed there, and they have different colors. So, so, so you can, you can have, have different index complexity that have all period one only. Okay? Then uh, there are 25 period two rules. Now you can see, uh, forget about the junks on top, the transient. Now, if you go a lot down below, you can see that begin to repeat every other row. Those are period two. Okay, there are twenty-five period two rules. Okay, and and I'm talking out of the eighty-eight. I'm not talking about the the two fifty-six because there's no need to go to this huge one. Just do the eighty-eight. Okay, and and uh, th there are six period six rules. Uh, I, I, I mean, so. I'm, that's out of 256, but let's just go to the, the 88. There are just four period three rules, the 62 that you have seen. And the 62 has three, three, three uh, siblings. I call them siblings, okay? They're, they're equivalent. One, you have one, the other sibling will all behave the same way by, by the rule we just, just described. You look left, right, or, you, you, know, or you, 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 you change color. And there are only two uh, period six which is 94 and, and, and 133. Now, you notice, here's, a, here's an example. Most of the rule has four, has three, has four siblings, OK? But 94 has only one because it repeats. Uh, 94, say the left right transform is also 94. And 133, you see, because you look at 94, the, 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 the both, both edges are red. So after you swap them, they're still red. So, so they are the same. That's, that's why it's not exactly one half of 256, okay? And, uh, and I mean, it's not, otherwise you think that 256 should be divided by four. You don't divide by four because there are oddballs like this, okay? So there are six period six rules. There are, if you go back to the 256 to 25, um, they, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I get, get, get the reverse order. Okay, now we are going to do something very interesting now. This is the main subject today. I call this the, the Bernoulli rules. Uh, can I go to 235, please? Okay, here, 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 here. remember out, out of out of 256, I told you earlier, there are 108 of them, almost half, you know, that are all Bernoulli shape. And I will have exactly the, 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 the algorithm that will tell you the kids, these are children's stuff again. I can, I can pick out this 108, I ask the children to pick up these this rules for me. 
Okay? So what are the Bernoulli shape rules? Well, I'm going to pick 170 first. 170 uh, happens to be one interesting rule that, uh, if, if that, I, that that's so, so interesting that it grazed the cover of volume four. It has a monkey again, okay, for kids, okay? And the monkey is cranking out 170 and turns out that this is a fantastic uh, rule that cranks out random numbers. But for now, uh, the Bernoulli shape it has three parameters. I'll show you two first. The sigma can be positive. Well, forget about the zero. That's, a, that's just a, for completeness. Is it positive or negative? Integer. And tau is always positive. So, so you have two parameters, uh, uh, both integer, but sigma can be positive and negative. And there's a third parameter I didn't have space here. It's called beta. And beta is it's not a number. Parameter beta is either positive or negative. And when beta is positive, we say do nothing. When a parameter is negative, we simply say you do the same thing, else, and then you change all the color afterward. That's, that's all. So, so in other words, out of, out of 108 Bernoulli rules that you will see shortly, you will be able to, to predict the behavior after the junks uh, disappear, exactly what it will look like, and you simply need these three parameters, sigma, tau, and beta. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the simplest one, 170. So 170, if you see, now I give the number parameter on the right. Sigma is one, tau is equal to one, beta is positive. Again, so when beta is positive, you just don't care, you ignore it. So you only have plus one, sigma, and tau minus one. Now, what does it mean? You look at any row here, I mean, uh, in this one of those oddball rules, by the way, that there's no transient, by the way, so you can, you, you can start anywhere, but it just picks anywhere here, focus on one, on one row, and the next row is exactly obtained by shifting the upper row one bit to the left. Every one of them. It's that simple. Kid stuff, okay? And so, if you, so sigma plus one means you shift one bit to the left. And tau equal to one means you do it every iteration. That's, that's, that's 180. And, and by the way, this is certainly something that you would agree that, that, that monkeys can learn because all that, how, how does a monkey do it? You just teach him to look to his right and copy the color. Okay, when, when, when you look right, you copy the color, you're shifting to the left. So left bit is, is, is trivial to teach monkey. Just copy. Just copy the color on your right. And that's, that's, you know. So for that, I'm going, I have a cartoon here. Can I go to uh, the copy cut monkey, 299? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, copy cut monkey. That's Bernoulli. Uh, no. The monkey should be. Yeah, copycat. Well, this, this is interesting. This, I mean, this is, you can see, it's, it's a true thing. It's, it published in uh, 2006 in Science News. I just, it's in the cover. So, so, so uh, anyway, uh, these are copycat monkeys. It's, it's, it's just uh, sort of, I think, fits in well for my talk to, today. Well, the copycat monkey, here, here is a two monkey, the psychologist. This is a three day old monkey. It was just, this is a three day, third day. So the monkey, the, the, the psychologist stick his tongue out and the three day old monkey was looking at it. A few hours later he come back and the monkey was sticking his, his, his tongue out, his copy cut, okay? He was teaching him, him, a three day old monkey can learn that. So that's, so that's good for kids stuff, you know, because three, uh, the three day old monkey can, can copy. Can I go back again, please? Oh, but before you do that, just one more slide. It turns out, as I told you, all of this are special case of CNN, a simpler one. In this case, you only need one template. That template there will do 170, okay? So every one of 250 is a trivial application of CNN that you already know. So, so that's why this is all really, in some sense, all connected, okay? But as I said, I, I would form a company, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur, and I would just, just build a single, because a single cell, you know, that will get all the 256 rules, and I can sell them for $10, and you can do everything, you know, I'd like a toy, uh, I think, and, and very educational, okay? Uh, let, me, let me go back again, please, uh, to, to the previous one, okay? So, so that's, uh, no, no, uh, wait a minute. 
No. Uh, go back. Please, please go back to 235. OK, we, we just started talking about Bernoulli shift. And now you know that, that what the meaning is. And, and the first one is, the, is, is an illustration. When sigma is equal to 1 tau equal 1 beta greater than 0, that's, that's the simplest one. You should shift left every iteration. What about, OK, now this is just an example. I, I just, just pick up two, any two rows. You can see the bottom row is exactly the shift of the upper row by one bit, because sigma is plus 1. Plus 1 means go to the left. Tau equal 1 means the next row. Now, I'm going to go to, there's a left shift. The, the one is right shift. So you can, you can have two, rule 240, for example. Sigma is now minus 1. Tau is still plus 1. Beta is plus, so you ignore beta. And, and tau equal 1, so you do it every row. The only difference is that because it's minus 1, you now shift instead of to the left, to the right. OK? So you can see, take any two row. The next row is shifted one bit to the right. Those are the two simplest Bernoulli rules. Okay? So I call this the Bernoulli right shift. The first one is Bernoulli left shift. Okay? And this, uh, I have another cover that I didn't have. It's exactly, you see, it will turn out that the Bernoulli left shift or the, or the, uh, the one that shift to the left is equivalent to, you go to Las Vegas and you make coin toss. It's actually, Equivalent to that, which is quite amazing. Okay, we're going to talk about that next week. Yeah. So, the, so the left copy cut monkey. They, this time, the monkey would have to teach look left, you know, and then copy. That would make give you the right shift. Okay. Now, how about 148? That's another rule to just illustrate how this three integer comes in. This 148 has um, beta positive, sigma minus two, tau equal to two. Now, so beta positive, you ignore it. Sigma equal minus two means you shift to the right two, two bits instead of one. You shift two times. And tau equal to means every other iteration. So now I, 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 I'm just covering up all the things. So, so if you just look at it, you'll be confused. So just, just look at that. You see, every other bit, you can see the row is shifted to the right by two bits. Okay. It was agree. Certainly the children can do that. Okay. And uh, how about 25? Well, 25 is even more messy. You look at it, you, you can never see any pattern unless you have a theory. Uh, any, and nobody can see the pattern here, except now that I know it, I tell you that ignore beta because it's positive. Sip twice to the left because sigma is positive. So you will sit to the left by two bits, every five iterations. So I'm going to cover that. Now this is the fifth iteration. Okay, you can see that you're shifting. The, the, the fifth row is shifted to the left by two. And, and the black stain covers five iteration. Okay, so how about beta equal to negative? It's now it's the first example. And I've got tau equal to one, sigma equal to tau equal. That's that's like the one seventy. So you do the same thing as the first one, but because beta is negative, you change color after we're done. So so you look just just look at any uh, look at uh, this this one. Okay, so the you would shift left by one bit. So the, the, the four red will be four red to the, to the left, but then you have to change color. That's the only difference. That's all. And uh, how about this one? This is very messy. I mean, no, no one could have, Wolfram would never realize that there's something, some, some, some simple thing going on here. It's, it says ignore the beta, no, 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 no need to change color. And you uh, shift minus one, shift right three bits, and every three iterations. That's what, what it is. You have three bits to every three iteration. So uh, the, the 108 bit, I know my just passed my time. Give me two more minutes. Uh, the 108 Bernoulli rules that have all these three numbers tabulated. All the kids can do that. Uh, you will agree. So the last thing I want to show you is the, my favorite cartoon. I didn't make that, okay? But this is Bernoulli. They, this, they have a family famous mathematician. One was famous for the calculus, one for the law of large numbers, uh, one for probability theory. So, so this, there's a unique family in, 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 in Europe. But the, the, the unfortunate, so this cartoon looks like you go to a law office, you got all these Bernoulli names, okay? And so the reception is asking which Bernoulli you want, okay? So that's a interesting, but, but what's interesting about Bernoulli that you didn't know? I always promise you didn't know something, right? The, what you didn't know is the Bernoulli family is, is a 
It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the worst family in the world. The, the father fights the son, is jealous of the son, and the, and the brother, is, everybody is jealous of the other. They're all, all great, you know, thinker, but, but they are, that's a, such a broken family, okay? And, uh, but our Bernoulli today is Jacob, okay? And to show you how, what kind of character he is, he, then he, he should look at the, top, the computation. Top. You take the 10th power of one, two, three, up to 1,000. How do you calculate that? In, you would think it's impossible. Jacob Bernoulli was very, very proud. He, he said, it took me less than half of a quarter of an hour to determine the sum of the 10th power of the first 1,000 positive integers. This shortcut made it clear how useless was the work of Ismail Bullialdo, who was his competitor at that time, in which he did nothing more than compute with immense labor, the sum of the first two. He said he did only the first six and, and he couldn't do it. He said, look, I did up to a thousand and it took me only a quarter of an hour, okay? And so the, the law of number, for example, Jacob, Sam Jacob say, even the stupidest man knows the law of large number by some instinct. He, he, he's making it sound so trivial. It turned out that he took him 20 years to do that, just to tell you the connection. Thank you very much.